What is the biggest moral crisis facing the country right now? Whenever I summarize my life's work, there has been one overwhelming theme. Ignorance. Pure, unadulterated ignorance. Presented with a smug smile. If society gets too secular, it ends. That's right, it ends. And that, right there, my fellow apes, is a good example of Dennis's theme. Oh! Welcome back to our series responding to Dennis Prager's Masters program. In the last episode, we delved into the sociology of morality, addressing Dennis's claim that if God doesn't say love your neighbour, then it's nothing more than a vapid, vacuous, sweet suggestion. If God doesn't say love your neighbour as yourself, it doesn't mean a damn thing. It's just a sweet suggestion. Oh, come on! Look at that face! Dennis gives even Jeremy Clarkson a run for his money. I know, it's so difficult not to look smug at this point. <laughs> Today, however, we're going to delve a little deeper into morality and thus address the root of all of Dennis's moral grandstanding. I'm Dennis Prager, and this is the Master's Program. My point is that if there is no God who says do not steal or do not murder, stealing and murder are not wrong. That doesn't mean that people who don't believe in God will necessarily steal and murder. Of course you can think that stealing is wrong, and you can feel that murder is wrong if you don't believe in God. But it's just what you think and what you feel, it's your opinion. They're not objectively wrong. There's no objective moral truth if there is no God. That's the whole point. It's not an attack, it's just a fact. Dennis's statement here represents the core of his moral views. Views that are shared by a lot of theists, perhaps even most, and so it's worth taking the time to really understand him, and of course, provide objections. That said, let's set the stage and get the pedantics out of the way, and let's do so in the Western analytical tradition. My point is that if there is no God who says do not steal or do not murder, stealing and murder are not wrong. So, what is the definition of murder? Murder is typically defined as the unlawful premeditated killing of one human being by another. And what does it mean to say that something is moral? We'll expand upon this later, but in a nutshell, something is moral if it has the quality of being in accord with standards of right or good conduct. Thus, to say that something is morally right is to say that it's in accordance with right or good conduct. But wait a minute. If murder is, by definition, not in accordance with right or good conduct, it's unlawful, then murder can never be right, can it? It is, by definition, wrong. Indeed, Dennis might as well have said that if there is no God, then who's to say bachelors are not married? So we're not really looking at objective morality here, are we? All we're looking at is an analytical statement, a statement that's true by definition. And the same is true of stealing. To steal is to take without permission or legal right. By definition, then, stealing is wrong. It's impossible for stealing to be right, since it is, by definition, wrong. All we're looking at here is an analytical statement. Given this, when Dennis says, Of course you can think that stealing is wrong, and you can feel that murder is wrong if you don't believe in God but it's just what you think and what you feel, it's your opinion. We can either be sure that he hasn't a concept of analytical philosophy, nor basic logic, or that he's defining these words in a loose way. For instance, if we remove the legal elements and thus define theft as simply taking without permission, and murder as premeditated killing of one human being by another, then the analytical objection doesn't go through, does it? That's true. However, this opens a giant can of worms, which we're tucking into now. You know, I think it's story time. A man summons all his strength to deliberately tear down the supporting pillars of a building, and by doing so he kills himself and 3,000 men and women. Now, are there any circumstances where we would say that this act is morally justifiable? If, as the Ten Commandments teaches us, killing is objectively wrong, then what possible justification could we find for this action? Well, this example comes from Dennis's favourite book. Samson called onto the Lord, begging for divine strength, so that he could pull the building down on the 3,000 men and women. And thus, Samson became the world's first suicide bomber. Well, not literally, but you get the idea. 
Yet, he is a character who has been idolised in popular culture and depicted in a vast array of films, artwork and literature. Certain Christian scholars have even compared him to Jesus. So why, precisely, is Samson's act not considered immoral? The Bible clearly states, Thou shall not kill, and yet Samson killed 3,000 men and women. How can this be justified? If morality is objective, as Dennis insists, then why is it okay to kill 3,000 people? Is it, perhaps, because Samson was carrying out God's will? Or was he justified because everyone in the building was, according to biblical accounts, wicked? All of them, without exception. The point I'm raising here is that if there's not a justification, then we have an instance of a biblical character, empowered by God no less, violating the commandment of thou shall not kill. But if there is a justification, then we're no longer in the game of objective morality, are we? Thou shall not kill becomes thou shall not kill unless justified, which is as useless as a degree from Prager University. But Dennis didn't say there's universal unchanging objective moral values, did he? No, he explicitly said that the only reason we shouldn't kill is because God says we shouldn't kill. My point is that if there is no God who says do not steal or do not murder, stealing and murder are not wrong. And God can change his mind, can't he? So for Dennis, objective morality is actually just a matter of opinion then, with that opinion being God's. Given this, we can say that God gave Samson a special exception. Samson prayed with all of his might, for a special pleading fallacy, and then God said unto him, All right, my dude, thou murder them all. If God doesn't say love your neighbor as yourself, it doesn't mean a damn thing. It's just a sweet suggestion. <clears throat> your male and female slaves are to come from the nations around you. From them, you may buy slaves. You may also buy some of the temporary residents living among you and members of their clan born in your country, and they will become your property. You can bequeath them to your children as inherited property and make them slaves for life. If God doesn't say you can't buy slaves, it doesn't mean a damn thing. It's just a sweet suggestion. Yeah, what's sauce for the goose is sauce for the gander. It's not an attack, it's just a fact. As discussed in the first chapter, if Dennis is defining murder in a typical sense, then he's expressing nothing more than an analytical statement, and thus is simply wrong. Murder is wrong with or without God, just as a bachelor isn't married with or without God. And as discussed in the second chapter, the only way Dennis can make sense of the ironically relative and thus subjective nature of his supposed objective moral values is to appeal entirely to divine command theory, which is precisely what he does. Something is right or wrong if and only if God says so. My point is that if there is no God who says do not steal or do not murder, stealing and murder are not wrong. And this brings us neatly to what is, by my lights, the most effective way to explore divine command theory. And that is through the Euphrophro Dilemma, which asks whether something is morally good because God commands it, or whether God commands it because it is morally good. In the context of Dennis's claim, we can ask whether killing is wrong simply and solely because God says so, or whether God commands us not to kill because it is in fact wrong. Let's consider each of these horns in turn. First, suppose that killing is wrong simply because God commands that killing is wrong. This is the divine command theory view, and it commits us to saying that right and wrong is determined solely by what God commands or prohibits. However, the chief objection to this horn of the dilemma is known as the arbitrariness objection. This objection points out that if right and wrong are determined solely by God's commands, then morality becomes arbitrary and capricious. God could command us to do anything, no matter how immoral, and it would actually be morally right to do so. For instance, if God was to command us to kill children, as he in fact did command people to do multiple times in the Bible, then it would be morally right to kill children. No ifs, no buts, it would be objectively the right thing to do. In fact, it would be morally wrong not to kill children. That's, that's not exactly... Morality, is it? No, that's nothing more than might makes right. Ironically, for many, including myself, divine command theory violates every moral intuition I have. Weird, huh? The Almighty has equipped me with a moral compass that contradicts the world he's weaved. And if I can't learn to ignore my inner angel, then God will eternally forsake me, 
How befitting of an all-loving and all-powerful God. And this brings us to the second horn of the dilemma, the view that God commands us not to murder because it is wrong. This view is a variation of moral realism, and it holds that morality is independent of God's will. On this view, there are objective moral facts that exist independently of God, and God's commands are merely an expression of these facts. The issue for theists, of course, is that if God commands us not to kill because it is wrong to kill, then, well, they're wrong when they say There's no objective moral truth if there is no God. To the contrary, in fact, under this view, objective moral truths exist entirely independent from God. Hence, God's existence, let alone his commands, are not necessary for morality. And this really can't be stressed enough. Dennis is left morally bankrupt. He either has objective moral values that exist independent of God, or he has a divine dictator. It's not an attack, it's just a fact. Now, how might Dennis respond to this dilemma? Well, Dennis doesn't really respond to objections at all. He's far too busy pumping out gish gallop and propaganda. But if he were to respond, he'd most likely tell us, as other apologists do, that this is a false dilemma, a black and white fallacy. He'd give us a third option, namely that God's nature is the standard of goodness. Now, the problem for the skeptic is this is not a true dilemma. This is what we call a false dilemma. And God doesn't arbitrarily make up a standard. God is the standard. That's the third option. The buck has to stop somewhere, and it stops with God. So he's not looking beyond him. He's not inventing a moral standard. He is what we call justice, righteousness, and goodness. He is the standard. Hence, God's commands are not arbitrary, but are based on his own inherently good nature. So when God commands us not to kill, it is good because not killing reflects his own good nature. Make sense? Yeah, it, it doesn't. It's just kicking the can down the road. Saying that we shouldn't kill because not killing aligns with God's character is, in essence, just the first horn restated. The question becomes, is God good because he aligns with goodness, or is he good because he defines what good is? If God's good because he aligns with some goodness, then the good exists independent of God. Whereas if God defines what is good, then morality is arbitrary. The point here is that for all of Dennis's insistence that those who don't believe in his God can't sufficiently ground morality, he's failed to explain how he can. And that's the crux. He can't. Dennis doesn't have objective moral values. He has, if anything, a divine North Korea. Fancy another story time? You do? Good! You're a medieval serf to a generously proportioned lord. Let's call him, I don't know, Lord Prager. Lord Prager has been too busy fighting off libtard snowflakes campaigning to raise the age of consent to 12, and so hasn't noticed that one of his farms, the farm you serve on, has fallen into famine. This isn't a problem for him, though, because most of his other farms are doing just fine. In fact, he has so much grain that most of it's going to spoil. Now, unfortunately, this leaves you up shit creek without a paddle, because the way you feed your family is by keeping a proportion of the food from the farm you live on. So, sadly, you and your family are going to starve to death. Weeks later, sick and exhausted, you beg Lord Prager to kindly give your family enough food to see you through the winter, but he says no. Despite you having an impeccable record over the last decade, he believes every single result is due to meritocracy, which means that you failed because of your own actions, and so you don't deserve even a crumb. Now, are you morally obligated to watch your family and yourself expire? Or do you have justification to break into that barn and still? Yeah, I think you're justified to take without permission too. You ought to violate one of those commandments. The truth is that while universal, unchanging, objective categorical imperatives sound great on the surface, when tested to their limit, they strike most of us as, funny enough, immoral. Remember, though, Dennis's divine command theory isn't unchanging. God can change his mind or create exceptions. Just as God told Samson, thou shalt rage, God could, in principle, tell a starving serve to steal from a gluttonous lord. But that's the thing. Absent a divine intervention, how can Dennis possibly justify explicitly violating God's objective moral commands? Well. We'll get to this in a moment. For now, here's Stephen Pinker expanding on some of the now problematic moral edicts in the Bible. 
Also in the Bible, one sees that the death penalty was the uh, accepted punishment for crimes such as homosexuality, adultery, blasphemy, idolatry, talking back to your parents, and picking up sticks on the Sabbath. As Stephen asks in his TED talk, why should we not kill people for all these crimes in the modern world? These commands are, after all, issued by God, are they not? I mean, are we really to believe that God has changed his mind without communicating as much? Really, that doesn't gel well with his omni traits, does it? What's more, there's pretty much no evidence to support such a pivot. And if God did change his mind, then these commands were the inerrant word of God one day, and then just silly atheists reading too literally the next day. God, new atheists, sir, they're so unsophisticated. Why do they have to take historical religious practice so seriously? Don't they know that the only true religious people are those alive today? With exactly the same views as Dennis. Sark aside, this really is a serious problem for theists. While they can justify a few violations of their objective moral values by invoking divine intervention, when it comes to reinterpreting explicit commands that are, in this day and age, an affront to our moral intuitions, they have to employ the most absurd apologetic acrobatics to achieve reinterpretation. Sure, the Bible endorses slavery all throughout, and none of the commandments prohibit slavery. What's more, and unfortunately for the Christians, Jesus was too busy burning bushes to simply tell us that slavery is a tad problematic. In fact, Jesus told slaves to obey their masters with respect and fear. But no, let's play some 3D chess. It's big brain time. There's a verse that says love thy neighbour, which, if we squint real hard, can be interpreted as to nullify all of the pro-slavery verses, and thus we can ignore Jesus and the rest of the book. Again, I can't believe that atheists read scripture so literally like most Jews, Christians and Muslims have throughout history. It's just cringe, I tell you, it's unbelievable. And while we're at it, the same is true of the starving serf. Yes, the Bible clearly states stealing is wrong, but we can ignore this command by invoking the command to love thy neighbour. No good neighbour would watch their serf starve, and so, actually, it's Lord Prager that's morally wrong. To quote Azim Sharif, the very consistency that makes the divine rule-based approach so trustable and predictable also makes it problematic. Non-negotiable, unchanging rules are prone to becoming outdated or overtly narrow, especially in diverse, dynamic, fast-changing communities. In the wild, where a slight break in social cohesion might spell the end of the tribe, the uncompromising dogma of organised religion was arguably beneficial. At least I'd argue that there's good evidence to support this. Organised religions are, to sum them up, the perfection of conservatism. But in a cosmopolitan world that's enriched with scientific knowledge, the rigidity of religion is, as Asim put it, problematic. The fact that religions tend to so often be the enemy of civil rights and social justice isn't a coincidence. Abrahamic religions have, for instance, oppressed women's rights whenever in power. Seeing women as literally inferior, they have, to scratch the surface, condemned contraception, abortion, and other forms of family planning, making it pretty much impossible for women to control their own bodies and make informed decisions about their health. The pious force subservient gender roles on women from childhood, essentially teaching them to anticipate and accept abuse. And, of course, they've prevented women from receiving an education, which serves to nefariously maintain the illusion that man is superior and has prevented women from ever questioning the cruel confines of patriarchy. But what's the point I'm driving at here? Simply, it's to illustrate that even though Dennis's supposed objective moral values can change on account of them being the entirely whimsical views of God, what these moral values can't directly adapt to is new information. If they change at all, it has to be through, frankly, the most pathetic apologetic acrobatics. This is why religious morality is problematic. It's why, again and again and again, modernity has had to drag the religious kicking and screaming into the future, only for the next generation of zealots to boast that this great world that we've inherited is actually due to their religion. Now, don't get me wrong, things are almost never black and white. With all civil and social justice movements, there were theists firmly supporting them. Christians played no small part in the emancipation of slavery, for instance. But the fact that Christians didn't eradicate slavery for over a thousand years of complete dominating power isn't, to anyone who's actually read the Bible, a surprise. 
And the fact that Christians only gave up slavery during the Enlightenment, at the end of the Enlightenment even, is just one illustration of the unyielding substrate of religion having to be dragged into modernity. You see, religious morality is not just problematic. In its struggle to adapt, it is often immoral. And it hasn't stopped. Dennis's appalling mistreatment of trans people, which we'll get to in a coming instalment, and his disdain for climate change activism, which we've already covered, are just two examples of the same damn merry-go-round. Today, if you give me a Christian, I'll give you a transphobe. Tomorrow, Christians will be loving their trans neighbours, insisting that it was Christian values, no sorry, Judeo-Christian values, that all along caused trans people to be acknowledged. Same crap, different century. Throughout this video, you will have noticed that I haven't presented an alternative objective moral framework, and there are several reasons for this, with the primary being that it's not necessary to debunk Dennis's claims. In fact, presenting an alternative would be a distraction. You see, what people like Dennis do is emphasise things that no one can ultimately account for, and questions that no one can ultimately answer, and then rather than explaining how they can account for these things, or how they can answer these questions, they simply point out that the other can't achieve as much. This is the bread and butter of presuppositionalism. And they get away with this for two broad reasons. The first is because most people are not philosophically literate, and thus are unaware of how these issues and questions are tackled and treated by philosophers. And the second is because most people are not philosophers themselves, and so haven't actually ruthlessly questioned their own beliefs. Their intuitions and in-group tell them that they have this sorted out, Murder is wrong because God says so, and so they don't need to hear Dennis present his solutions and answers because they already earnestly believe they're in possession of them. But they're not. As I hope I've illustrated here, once we delve into metaethics, it becomes unsettlingly clear that the answers are anything but simple. Yes, we could have discussed natural law, Kantian ethics, utilitarianism, virtue ethics, social contract theory, and so on. But again, there's no need. Because even if we grant that none of these models ultimately account for objective moral values, we're still left, with Dennis, completely empty-handed. He hasn't at all supported his account of objective moral values, he simply insisted that he has objective moral values because God says so, which deserves nothing more than a hitch slap. That which is asserted without evidence can also be dismissed without evidence. But that would have made for a pretty uninteresting video, huh? So I thought I'd do my best to provide a dip in the ocean for those interested in morality and its grounding. If we define murder in the legal sense, it's just an analytical statement, and if we define murder as the premeditated killing of one human being by another, then most objective moral frameworks are going to permit instances of murder. The difference between, say, a utilitarian and a divine command theorist is that the utilitarian is going to be able to provide a clear and logical justification, again, presuming we buy their assumptions whereas the divine command theorist is going to have to dig up some vague verse, and then convincingly explain why this vague verse supersedes several explicit commands stating the opposite. The truth is that religious people do not, and have never, had objective moral values, at least not in the sense that they mean. The moral edicts that Dennis lives by are every bit as arbitrary as an atheist's like I. Which is to say, they're not arbitrary. Our moral intuitions and social constructs, of which many are etched into scripture, are no more random than are our eyes or our fingers. Just as our physical features are the product of evolution by natural selection, so too are our psychological features. We've evolved to be uneasy around predators, just as we've evolved to care for our neighbours, to care for one another. It's no surprise, then, that religious and non-religious people typically have similar moral compasses, we are all working from the same set of basic principles. We are all one species. Now, as for whether our moral values are truly objective, that's another question for another time, that I'd answer one way, whereas another pro-secular person would answer another. Because despite Dennis's protestations to the contrary, secularism is not an ideology. Anyhow, as we have seen in the last two episodes, moral values are not conditioned on whether or not a god exists. The fact that Dennis attempts to justify his claim that society ends and morality dies in the secular world can only be seen as either extreme ignorance or willful deception. 
but since the Bible tells him unequivocally not to lie, we ought to wager that he's just ignorant. Then again, though, maybe he interprets love thy neighbour as to permit him to lie to his neighbour. I mean, if he can nullify all of the verses endorsing slavery by invoking loving one's neighbour, then, well, what can't he nullify? How conveniently subjective. Through his rhetoric, Dennis has explicitly attempted, and almost certainly with success, to demonise secularism. And the problem with this type of demonisation is highlighted by social psychologist Jonathan Haidt in his interview with Bill Myers. But the tribalism evolved ultimately for war, and when it reaches a certain intensity, that's when the, sort of the switches flip, the other side is evil. They're not just our opponents, they're evil. And once you think they're evil, then the ends justify the means. And you can break laws, and you can do anything because it's in the service of fighting evil. Rather than creating a dialogue on social issues, Dennis's mission appears to be to demonise the other, and by doing so, he is pushing his flock further away from non-religious people and people with other religions. This makes it all the more difficult to have a reasonable dialogue. Dennis paints a picture of a world where Peter's most controversial campaign is the norm for how people view the value of human life. He paints secularism as an apocalyptic and deprived world, where people are free to do whatever they want, as there's no god who says do not murder or do not rape. But here's the thing, I do all the murdering and raping I want, which is precisely none. For Dennis, though, we have to ask, if his god didn't prohibit murder, would Dennis just run around murdering people? That seems to be the implication here, doesn't it? And if so, then thank the gods that Dennis believes in a god. Aren't we lucky? Overall, Dennis has painted a cartoonish narrative of good versus evil, with, guess what, him being the good guy, and people like me being scum, unworthy of your time, much less your acknowledgement. Indeed, the consequences of Dennis's ignorance are truly catastrophic. I have no axe to grind here. My axe to grind is what is true. If you've enjoyed this episode and rationality rules more broadly, then please consider supporting us if you're able. We currently have three people on board and are hoping to expand as soon as we're financially able. And talking of which, a big thank you to everyone that supports the channel. Fighting the rhetoric and misinformation of people like Dennis takes time and dedication, and without you, we wouldn't be able to justify doing this. Thanks.